I'm ready when you are. Go ahead. Welcome everyone to this meeting of the Community Preservation Act Committee on November 9th, 2023. I'm calling the meeting to order at 6.05 p.m. Uh, we're meeting remotely via Zoom uh, as authorized uh, uh, per decision of the town of Amherst and permitted by the state. This meeting is being recorded and will appear on the town of Amherst CPA website page uh, at a later date for those who wish to view it. I'm going to call on uh, the members now to make sure that we can hear you and that you can be heard. Um, we do have a new member, Doug Marshall from the planning board. Welcome, Doug. Uh, I guess I'll call on you first to see if you can hear us and we can hear you. Hi, everyone. Okay. Uh, David Williams. Hello to everyone. Uh, Tim Neal. Greetings. Bob Saul. Hello. Yep. Michelle Labby. Present. Matt Kane. Hi, present. Robin Fordham. Hello. And I believe that's all the members. Uh, so I think we're good to go. As I said earlier, uh, we're hoping to accomplish, uh, you know, the, stick to a schedule because some of the presenters have other uh, meetings that are coming up around seven. So uh, the first item on our agenda is to elect a chair and vice chair. We delayed doing this at our last meeting in September, uh, pending the arrival of a full committee, which we have now. So I'd like to open the floor for um, elect a chair nominations. Um, I see a hand up from David Williams. Yes, uh, I would like to nominate Sam McLeod as chair of uh, the CPA committee. Again. There's a second from Michelle. Um, are there any other nominations for chair? I don't see any. Um, I will accept the nomination. Thank you, David and Michelle. Um, is there any discussion? I don't see any hands raised or indications. So I'm going to go ahead and call for a vote. Uh, voice vote is required on any votes that we have. Um, so I'll go uh, one at a time. Uh, David Williams. Yes. Tim Neal. Aye. Uh, Bob Saul. Aye. Robin Fordham. Aye. Matt Kane. Yes. Michelle Labby. Aye. Dave, uh, Doug. Aye. And again, Holly, uh, excuse me, uh, Katie is not able to attend today. I will say aye as well. So the vote is eight to zero, one absent. I realized that uh, I didn't indicate this earlier. We need to have a minute taker for the meeting. Uh, I volunteered last meeting, even though I haven't presented the minutes here. Um, is there someone willing to volunteer? I see Robin's hand up. Yeah, I'm going to get it out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Robin. And the thought process. So um, nomination for a vice chair. Uh, I'll open it up to the committee. I'm not seeing any hands raised. Uh, I'll make a nomination. Uh, I'll, I'd like to nominate Tim Neal as vice chair. Second. Second. We have a nomination and a second. Uh, are there any other nominations? Uh, discussion. Uh, Tim, is this uh, nomination? That's fine. Something? That is fine. Okay. So we have a <clears throat> nomination and a second. I'd like to proceed with a, a vote. Um, and we'll go sequentially. Uh, David Williams? Yes. Tim Neal? Yes. Bob Saul? Yes. Robin? Aye. 
Matt? Yes. Michelle? Aye. Doug? Yes. And I will vote aye as well. So the vote is eight to zero with one absent. So um, the next item on our agenda is public comment. We have a public comment session on every meeting that we have. Um, we also will be having a public comment and a public hearing for all the proposals in December. Uh, so the public comment here is just a standard one for uh, every meeting that we have. I'd like to uh, invite any attendees or members who might be uh, community members who might be listening to uh, speak or add a comment if they wish. Uh, for those who are attendees, uh, if you'd like to make a comment, could you please raise your hand so that we can see you? Um, or if that's not functioning, you can also seek to utilize the chat feature. I'm going to wait a minute. I'm not seeing any hands raised. Uh, I'll wait one more minute in case there's uh, someone seeking to access via a different avenue. Okay, so uh, no public comment. Um, so I think we're okay to commence with our presentations. And uh, I see Carol Lewis is in the audience as an attendee. And uh, if you're ready, Carol, we'd like to, I'd like to invite you into the meeting to present your designated time is 6.15, but I know you um, have a lot going on. So I can see you in the meeting although right now you're, uh, there you go, you've un- I think I'm now all the way here. <laughs> Wonderful. So uh, thank you. Good to see you, Carol. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. I'm. Uh, do you know if Erica is in the, uh, in the Erica. attendance? Uh, would you Erica mind? If she's. We are co-chairs and I'm going to do the presentation, but if you wouldn't mind having her in here so she has a comment you could make it, that would be great. Uh, certainly. Uh, okay, I'm taking care of that. She should be in in a second. Here we go. So, so uh, let's see if the microphone is working. Erica, if you're able to unmute as needed. Thank you for having me here. Uh, hi, Erica. Nice to see you. Thank you for joining us to both of you. Um, so I, I'm just wondering if for the public, we should just sort of announce the um, that this is for the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust with a CPA proposal ask of $500,000 under the community housing category for development funds. Thank you for that. I probably would have forgotten that important part of what we're supposed to say. Um, thank, thank you, Holly. So Carol and uh, Erica, the... the Okay, so I, um, well, thank you for giving us this opportunity to present, and I, I don't think it's a question for any of us that Amherst, like so many other places, needs more affordable housing. So the first thing I want to urge you to do is to support community housing um, to the fullest extent that you can among all the proposals that you get. The Donahue Institute's 2022 housing study shows Hampshire County currently needing 1,500 rental units below $1,000 a month to meet this housing need. Available 2020 census data indicates 62% of current renters in Amherst spend more than 30% of their income on housing and 42% spend more than half. Both percentages are higher than those shown in 2010 census data. Looking at this another way, there were 501 applications for 28 studio units in the recently opened East Gables. 20 of those incoming residents had no stable home prior to coming, in spite of at least one of them having a full-time job. In Massachusetts, the home ownership rate for people of color, 35%, is about half of the rate for white people, 68%. 
This is a statewide disparity that is currently the sixth greatest in the nation. The Housing Trust is one of the few entities that can hold CPA funds without identifying a specific project. The trust thus is in a unique position in addressing this housing situation. You do your funding work annually, for which we are most grateful. We meet monthly and can meet needs that cannot be anticipated a year in advance, providing funding that can leverage other funding and demonstration of town commitment. When a project already is in project progress and comes up short, given something like unexpected price increases, we can help fill the gap as we did with East Gables. When a pandemic hits, we can set up a program of emergency rental assistance. When property the town owns has potential as a housing site but needs pre-development work to determine feasibility, we can fund some of that work as we've done with East Street, Strong Street, and currently beginning to do with the uh, um, VFW project. Because there are fewer sources that can be used to fund home ownership projects, we can also significantly contribute to the funding of such projects, projects essential to Amherst's efforts to reduce the wealth gap between our white and BIPOC populations. Currently, Valley CDC's Amherst Community Homes, which to which we have made our most recent allocation, that project is currently going through the ZBA approval process. When a promising property comes up for sale and must be acquired promptly to retain the possibility of affordable housing development as Belchertown Road, we can help in that acquisition. And an important at least sidebar to me here is that Amherst is a lot of things. One of the ones that we don't talk about very often is it's a fixed and finite land mass. Much of the land can't be used for housing at all because it is protected farmland or open space, because it is wetland or protected habitat. So missing an opportunity to acquire, acquire any of the land that could be affordable housing potentially isn't easily remedied. The trust can do all the kinds of things that I have just described, as well as various other things like a lot of public education and outreach. We can only do these things, however, if we have money in our accounts. The funds we have at present, 447,000 approximately after encumbrances, may be very quickly exhausted by projects already in the pipeline. We already anticipate somewhere near $200,000 in requests by the end of 2023. This would render us unable to step in early to add to that pipeline by doing something that needed to be done on a short timeline, something unanticipated in the CPA proposal cycle, something we may not even have thought of yet that has the potential, potential for more affordable housing in Amherst, the need for which has only grown. The $500,000 we are requesting from CPA will help us be the resilient partner Amherst needs us to be. Thank you and questions. So um, I'd like to, does Erica have anything she wanted to add to your presentation at the moment or questions is fine as well? Early questions are fine. Okay. Uh, I'd like to open it up to the committee. Uh, for any questions or comments uh, that you might have for Carol. And thank you, Carol, for uh, uh, providing this information for us. You're most welcome. I'm not, I see a hand from uh, Bob. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a brand new member. So I'm just gonna ask sort of a point of information how long has the trust been in existence and was it specifically put in place for this purpose that the a town needed more flexibility, responsiveness to opportunities that came up? I should remember, maybe Erica does or Dave does. The 2017. date, 2017? I believe it's 2017. Bylaw. Uh, that, that, in that point, the town adapted a, adopted a bylaw that created the trust as the state has the possibility for towns to do that. And that was the point at which the town did it. And the mission, yes, was of kind of affordable housing in all its all its 
realms, like create housing that is for home homeownership, all the way from home ownership opportunity to closing the homelessness gap. Um, and I believe the idea part of I don't know the thinking of the people who put it in place, but I know that one of the things that is critical about it and important about it is that we can hold money that isn't for a particular project. We have a couple of other very minor funding sources, but this is the main one at the moment, at least the CPA. Um, and so it is the hope is that there's a, then a group of people dedicated working with the town, working with uh, nonprofit developers and anyone else we can find to do some kind of housing development that we can be paying attention to this one thing kind of while the town is needing to pay attention to so many things. Um, we could, I think an early on a decision was made because housing trusts are allowed by statute to hold property, uh, to be landlords kind of, of affordable housing projects, but our trust being smaller, the town being smaller, we decided our, our job is pushing places, funding the gaps, finding the possibilities, collaborating where collaboration works, which is, we don't have enough money to to do anything by ourselves. So we are kind of sometimes the thorn in somebody's side maybe in order to try to make something happen. Hopefully we don't need thorns in the side. We just get to be cooperative um, co-creators of affordable housing. And that might have been a lot of words that didn't even answer your question, but I hope that helped, Bob. No, it did it, it, it completely answer my question. Thank you, that was perfect. Thank you. Uh, if, I, yeah. if I can add, if oh, I can just right. add, um, I was just going to add that part of our mission is also to ensure affordable housing to the most vulnerable. So as Carol said, is that we are sort of a catalyst as well as an advocate for ensuring that there are pipeline initiatives. Uh, we work very closely with uh, the town as well as with town council because we're sort of really um, all working together and for our the way Carol mentioned is that we're looking for the niche where we can have the most impact that town council, the town cannot have. So um, we're really, part of what we do is we, we keep affordable housing at the table and a focus on that in the town constantly. Thank you, Erica. Uh, Tim, I see that your hand is yes, up. Yes, I have a, just a quick question. Uh, your application uh, states that the CPA has been one of your primary funding sources. Uh, do you happen to know off the top of your head, I must admit, I didn't go back and do the research to see how, much, how many funds the CPA has uh, distributed to you folks uh, since... No, is the short the answer. I could find that out and get you the answer, but I don't know it. Would you would you like me to to email it to the committee or something? Yeah, that that would be great. I was just curious to see what the universe is, because um, I re, I've been on the committee now. What this is th my third year. My recollection is you're asking for uh, large amounts every year, and that's great. But I was just curious what the total has been since the inception. I, I don't have that number, but I will get it for okay. you. And you're Thank correct. You. We have we ask pretty much every year, um, right. partly because we don't we don't have really at the moment any other sources of funding. Some towns actually have an arrangement with their CPA group where there's an automatic transfer to the to the housing trust, uh, so that we don't we don't do this every year because in many ways what we're asking for this year is the same thing we asked for last year different examples different things we're in the middle of now but still the 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 thing is build us a pot of money so when something comes along that we need to respond to we can mm -hmm. but i will will email you that uh answer erica you had your hand up earlier do you have something you'd like to add yes i just wanted to emphasize what carol just said that there are cpas where the affordable housing trust automatically gets a percentage where they don't have to go in front of the cpa because just in some municipalities that the affordable municipal housing trust is seen as an extension of the cpa to actually further affordable housing so we right now we don't as carol said we don't have any other revenue coming in we're hoping that the real estate uh transfer fee will be an opportunity for that, but that's in the future. That's not now. We don't know if that's going to go through or not. Um, but the CPA is really our only revenue that comes in. 
There, I should I should add one thing. There is the possibility. I don't think this has happened yet, but the inclusionary zoning bylaw has a provision that says if it's conceivable that a developer could get out of putting the required affordable housing units in the development by by paying money, and that money would go to the trust. That hasn't never hasn't happened, but. And I don't know that it would be how much, I don't know that it would be a significant source of money and it would certainly not be a reliable regular source of money, but I, I don't wanna overstate the case of how much money we don't have. I, we, we don't have it, but it is a possible source of money in the future sometime. Thank you, Carol. Uh, Doug? Yeah, I wondered what your relationship is to the housing authority in town that operates some of the affordable housing and public assistance housing. Thank you. Um, we are totally different and actually have just recently been trying to figure out how we might connect and help each other. We had the head of the housing or of, of Amherst Housing Authority at our last meeting in order to try and understand some of the things that some of their needs and some of their difficulties and uh, so there isn't really much overlap because they deal with subsidized stuff that has a particular source of of funding and they run the buildings that are owned for the purpose of affordable housing and i'm probably someone could give you a more technical answer than what I'm giving you. Um, but that's, we've been trying to develop more, more, a more cooperative relationship or at least understanding what each other does better. Is that any help, Doug? Yeah, yeah. I, I guess part of my question is about whether uh, you could help them do more than they are doing. And um because you know, I don't know very much about them, but I don't hear about a lot of initiatives from them to do more or to, you know, replace some of their relatively old housing or anything like that. Um, that's a good idea, and also I would say that the um the housing bond bill that the governor has just put forward has various things in it that will directly support housing authorities to do some of the things they have a lot of deferred maintenance they only get a certain amount of money sometimes they can't do the maintenance they would prefer to do and my understanding is that this bond bill is going is one of its goals is to correct some of that so that so that the turnover can be quicker um in the housing authorities in the state um I, i'm gonna call on David because the question related to housing. I see you, Michelle. Uh, David Williams. Yes. Um, the comments that you made are um, your own target. We basically have not been working um, outside of the realm of the properties that um, the city, town, own. However, I will be sure in our next board meeting, which is on the 20th, that we make a reach out and make a, arrangements for us to get together to discuss uh, housing in Amherst. One, to be sure that you understand what the housing authority is about, and also that we, I think we understand all of uh, what you all are doing, but uh, we definitely need to be working together. Yes, I agree. I'm sure Erica does too. He's going like. Yeah, uh, yeah if I can only like comment, uh, if I can just comment on that, um, that's one of the reasons why we had Pamela Rogers come and present to the um, Amherst Municipal Housing Trust Authority, um, just to make sure that we did understand what um, you know the housing authority did, what their mission is, and how we can support each other. And one of the ways we're supporting each other is we're definitely advocating with our representative Dom, and uh, who actually has visited recently there, as well as with our uh, Senator um, 
Comerford about the support that the housing authority needs in terms of funding for rehabilitation, as well as maintenance staff. And so, yes, we're trying to figure out what are all the challenges in order to get the vacancy uh, rate down um, and a quicker turnover to get the 14% vacancy rate um, really eliminated. Thank you, Erica. Michelle, you're on mute. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm also a fairly new member, so I'm just curious, does the does the trust generally spend down all the funds on an annual basis or is there ever like enough capital gains on what you have to sort of support the smaller programs that you mentioned you're involved with? We haven't gotten down to zero. <laughs> um, but the so it's a it's a it's a floating amount of money. We actually came into this CPA proposal with less money than we had when we came in last time because of the needs that have happened, the things that we've been able to fund in the interim. And so the goal is to kind of keep enough money there so that when something does come up, we can do it. And we, I don't know, I guess if we had a year in which we didn't use anything, maybe the next year we wouldn't ask for as much. But so far, there have we didn't get as much last year. I think it was two. We asked for five hundred, and I think you gave us two twenty-five. There were several other community housing proposals right there um, with ours, but um, so that's part of the reason that we come to you this year with a with a lower balance than we had when we came last time. Thank you, Holly. We're getting close to the next presentation. I did. So have I, I I just wanted to make a comment about the. Um, Municipal uh, housing trust funds are not actually turned over to them. They are a uh, trust fund on the town's books. Right. So yes, the money you. is in our accounts, not in their accounts. <laughs> um, and then um, it's spent directly from um, a trust fund on the town's books. Thank you, Holly. Um, I have a question, Carol. In your proposal application and reference that you had received a request for additional funding from the Ball Lane CDC project, an extra 125,000 uh, from 250 to 375. Uh, I'm curious, given the costs for all construction rising and all the uh, demands, what, what uh, would occur if the housing trust did not have the funds for Ball Lane. Is, has anything like that ever occurred in the past when they seek additional funding from their initial proposal? Um, it, it's I, always difficult to uh, not be in a position and you do have funding currently, but I'm curious, what have there been instances in the past where requests have not been fulfilled and what implications might there be? That's a very good question that I don't really know the answer to. I we've gratefully in the, my time on the trust, which is uh, four or five years, I think, have been able to fill the requests that came to us. Um, I think that what would happen is that the whoever the developer was would pull, be pulling their hair out, scrambling, trying to figure out what to do to fill the gap. Um, but I don't, I'm, I'm, I don't know. I don't know the answer. Maybe Dave knows more. He's been around longer at all of this. I'll call on you in one moment, Dave. And I have one follow-up question. You mentioned yeah. the Healy Driscoll $4 billion housing initiative, which is huge. Uh, and I understand that it has implications for the uh, <clears throat> housing authority. I'm wondering if it has implications or opportunities directly for the housing trust that is to say, is there any overlap? I'm seeing a head shake, no, uh, from your colleague. Uh, but I thought I'd ask, uh, perhaps, uh, Erica, would you like to respond? Uh, so my understanding of um, the Affordable Homes Act, there are a lot of um, uh, proposed initiatives that would uh, help developers, it would help with the rising costs um, that are um, unpredictable. So in an indirect way, it helps the um, housing trusts to ensure that the funding that we provide to these projects can be maximized, 
but I don't see any direct funding to municipal affordable housing trusts, except they support the transfer, the real estate transfer fee. So that would then um, come, um, depending if it ever went through. Uh, I think that would be uh, a pretty major um, source of revenue. And then that would impact our ability to ask for possibly less or not have to come to the CPA. Um, but otherwise, I don't see anything directly to the um, housing trusts. Thank, thank you, Erica. We're running uh, short here. We, we have other presentations. Nate, I see, is in the audience. He also has a tight schedule, as Carol and Erica know. Uh, so I'd like to just ask one more question. Dave has had his hand up patiently for some time. Uh, so Dave, is there something you'd like to add related to the uh, housing trust? Yeah, it can be very quick, Sam, just in answer to your question about funding shortfalls. Um, you know, in my tenure with the town, uh, working with Nate Malloy, the trust, various staff. I mean, by and large, you know, Amherst is an extremely supportive town for affordable housing. We've worked extensively with Valley CDC, Wayfinders, and other groups. Um, it, we all need to keep in mind the, the kind of scope and scale of some of these projects. These projects are millions and millions of dollars. So what we can offer is we can't close those large gaps we can close the smaller gaps. We right. we can show the state and federal government that we are a town that says yes, that we we want these projects to happen. So uh, by and large, we try very hard. Uh, we have devoted some, Paul Bachman has devoted some ARPA funding, and we've helped close some of those gaps for Valley CDC and, and Wayfinder. So in short, you know, we do the very best we can. Keep in mind, these projects have multiple, multiple funders. So if there's a $100,000 gap and we can only give 50 or whatever the number is, that that Valley or Wayfinders, they they will need to go to their other their other funders and say, hey, Amherst stepped up to, to the plate, but couldn't close the whole gap, could you? So the other thing is, you know, again, just Holly commented a little bit on the structure of the trust. The trust, keep in mind the trust for those new members here, the trust is really part of the town. We are we are one. Um, we are working together very closely. Planning department staff provide the day to day, week to week, month to month of staffing and support for the trust. We just we're using some CPA money and other funds. We just hired a part time uh, planner to assist the uh, the trust. And um, as Holly said, the finances are really all overseen by her department. So it's a it is a much different thing than the housing authority, which is really quite separate from the town. Very important in town and provides wonderful service, but the trust and the town are really very much aligned and and part of uh, one another. So just wanted to add that. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, so I, I guess we're, we're done here for the moment, uh, Carol and Erica. Thank you both for uh, sharing your thoughts, knowledge, and discussing your proposal with us. Uh, if we have additional questions, we might email you. And there was one item that you indicated you would provide uh, feedback, I believe, to Tim's question. So please email that to Holly and or myself. Um, I see I your will. hand is up, Carol. Uh, Can yes? I, I just I just wanted to know if that so you are there, is there any reason why we should stay here longer in the meeting? Is there something that's gonna happen up at a later date or is it okay if we go now and it, go to our It's fine meeting? for you to go. We're hearing from presenters, uh, four different presenters. The next one happens to be somewhat Damn. associated with <laughs> right. uh, your activities. You're quite welcome to stay in the audience and listen if it's beneficial. I do know you have a meeting to chair. Um, it's at your discretion, how whatever works. But if we have further questions, which may come up, we'll communicate. And the process for the committee on the whole is after we hear all presentations, we'll have a uh, public hearing in December, after which the committee will deliberate similar to last year's. So okay. thank you both again. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I see Thanks, that Nate Carol. is in the audience, Holly, uh, and the next presentation is the town of Amherst reporting housing development funds. So um, without further ado, thank you for waiting patiently, Nate. Uh, the floor is yours. Sure, thanks. Uh, yeah, I'm Nate Malloy. I'm a planner with the town. And so, uh, you know, the town's put in a request for uh, affordable housing pre-development funds, uh, 275,000. 
And, you know, Dave mentioned that the, the trust is, um, you know, part of the town, but there's a few key differences. One is the trust is statutorily um, enabled to bank CPA funds without a specific project. So it's one of two entities in the CPA legislation that they can acquire funds to capitalize themselves. Typically, an entity like the town even has to request CPA funds for a project that's more defined or specific. So in our proposal, we mentioned municipally owned properties. We mentioned Strong Street, uh, the former VFW site, the South Amherst campus, uh, and there's a few other municipal properties. And so really what the town is doing is requesting funds to further affordable housing on municipally owned property. Uh, so it is slightly different than how the trust can operate with CPA funds. And Dave mentioned that, you know, there are gaps. And so typically affordable housing projects don't, um, they can't apply for pre-development funds from their, their, the bigger subsidy agents, subsidizing agents. And so uh, there's a few that will provide it. Um, usually they, will seek local funds to get pre-development funds, and then they leverage that with a match. And so oftentimes it's at their expense or you know, Valley CDC or Wayfinders, for instance, will apply to the town for CPA funds or trust funds to work on pre-development funding. Um, we're taking that initiative and in, in doing that this year because um, you know, Wayfinders is working on their East Street, Belchertown Road property. Valley is moving through permitting on Ball Lane. But after that, there aren't any projects that really are concrete right now. Uh, there are some municipal properties, you know, the VFW needs to get moved along, but we often say that from concept design to someone moving in can be five years. And so it takes a while to get a project through, you know, funding, through permitting, through everything. And so really we're trying to have uh, projects moving along at different um, points in the process. Uh, so there's always a project coming and, you know, not having a three-year gap. And, and that's really important. I think there's a number of priorities in town. There's senior affordable housing, there's homelessness, there's transitional housing, there's housing for families, for individuals. And so there's a bunch of different housing types that are needed at different income levels. And really we're hoping the pre-development funds will be able to jumpstart projects and then leverage other funds. And so often, so for instance, with Valley at um, Northampton Road, we were able to put in some CPA money and block grant money for pre-development funds and then they were able to uh, also get CP, uh, some, some pre-development funds from um, other quasi-public state-level organizations. But if our local funds weren't there, they probably wouldn't have secured those other pre-development funds. And so really it is about matching funds and leveraging funds. And that local piece is really important. So local funds indicate a support for the project, even if it's just pre-development funds. Um, then permitting can be another level of support. But to have some financial skin in the game, as you'd say, is really important for a developer. They know that the town is serious. And so we can actually move a project along to a point where maybe the, pro the property's already been assessed. There's been a survey, there's wetlands, um, you know, there could be concept plans. And so they can come in and we, maybe we've already established a program for the site like we did at Belcher Town Road. You know, the housing trust and the town work together to determine kind of the number of units, the amenities. We developed a request for proposals. And then there was a public procurement process that chose Wayfinders. And so really we were able to, you know, get that product to a point where, um, you know, there'd been public meetings, public forums, there were concept designs developed and all of that was to get the housing going. And so what we've requested is funding to really do that on a number, you know, three to five properties that are town owned right now. Uh, thank you, Nate. Sure. Um, I'd like to open, uh, open it up for the committee, uh, for any questions or comments, uh, for Nate or for the committee. I see a hand, uh, Doug, thank you. So Nate, uh, why 275? Why not 375? Why not a million? Sure. Must, yeah. It's it feel that number makes it feel like you actually have some specific in mind and you've kind of worked out some, you know, a ballpark budget for some things. Yeah, I think in the proposal is mentioned that um, you know, we're envisioning that even at the VFW, it could be a hundred thousand dollars for uh, architectural and, and engineering plans. And Strong Street, it's a 13 acre property off of Strong Street that the town uh, acquired through tax title a number of years ago, maybe it can yield six, maybe 10, maybe 12 units. 
it's something that's been slowly uh, assessed, but you know, to really examine that, we would need to do some more engineering studies, uh, look at utilities, uh, you know, what what could happen there. And so we have some ideas of you know how much money those contracts would cost. I mean, I think sure half a million, but I think just realistically, two seventy five is a number that you know, like I said, it could it could move a three projects ahead, and then you know, if in two years the town says, "Wow, this was successful," maybe we'd come back again. Um, we're not trying to capitalize a bank account like the housing trust. So we're not just asking for a large amount um, that would, you know, remain to be allocated. We're saying, okay, we have 275. We're really going to target it to, um, you know, a few projects or a few studies or needs. And so, you know, could it be different? Sure. Um, but I, I think, you know, 275 seemed reasonable. Uh, Bob? Yeah, um, uh, again, sort of a beginner question here, but um, the, so these, the, this number is actually targeted towards specific projects. It's different than the trust, where the trust is sort of, the, there's uncertainty and they're attempting to be prepared for uncertainty to become concrete. You've got concrete uh, projects identified, and so they go into your bailiwick instead of the trust. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, the trust may end up being a partner or provide funding if necessary, but like I mentioned, the CPA legislation allows the trust to receive CPA funding for community housing without a specific project. And so it's just to capitalize the housing trust. They still have to follow CPA guidelines when the funds are, are expended. But for instance, the trust could, you know, have you know, eight hundred thousand dollars from CPA in their account over a number of years of making requests, and then they could field proposals. You know, to provide rental subsidy, to support mm -hmm. um, the development of senior housing, affordable housing, to develop rental units, and so it's really they have the that flexibility. Whereas we're looking at, you know, like I mentioned, a few municipally owned properties. We'd like to assess and really determine how to move those forward for affordable housing. Got it. Thanks. Uh, Matt? Yeah, I guess the distinction is is what you said. Basically, it, we could just give the money to the Affordable Housing Trust and delegate to them how it gets distributed, or we can make the choice here in this committee. Right. Well, I think the, um, you know, one, one thing about the Housing Trust is, you know, they don't need to go through an annual cycle to to take a vote of funding, right? So even tonight at their right. meeting, Chris Gore is, is putting a is putting a proposal in um, for transitional housing subsidy, uh, and the trust could vote on it tonight or next meeting, and then the funding becomes available pretty quickly. Um, otherwise, you'd have to follow the annual CPA cycle. And the difficulty there is, you know, proposals are due in the fall, and funding isn't available till the following July, and so oftentimes a project can't wait a year to receive funding, and so. For the town, that's not necessarily a problem, right? The funding can become available in July and we'll start work, working on contracts, you know, over the next six to eight months. Uh, the difference being the housing trust, if they have money available, they can spend it on a project, um, you know, through a vote of, of, of their board. Uh, Bob, do you have another question? I see your hand is up. No, okay. Um, Nate, I have a question for you. I see that in the proposal that references funding 10 to 15 professional contracts in varying ranges. Uh, and there's also a number of different projects, potential projects referenced uh, where the funds might apply. Um, in terms of prioritization, uh, what kind of time frame would you anticipate a need for the various professional contracts? Is it perhaps a two-year cycle? Uh, where maybe in the first year there would be, you know, six different ones. Do you have any indication in terms of how that might roll out? I recognize the flexibility that it can provide, but I'm curious what's uh, imminent versus near term versus soon. Sure. So yeah, you know, we uh, Dave mentioned. I think. Uh, I thought someone mentioned that we you know the town hired with you know CPA funding and trust funding a, a part-time housing coordinator, associate planner position. They just started this week. And so the hope is that you know adding capacity to staff that next year, um, 
you know, the CPA funding I mentioned, it could be over a two year period. So, right, the idea would be to get a few contracts going in the first year and a few in the second. So there's some remaining ARPA funds for the for 457 Main Street, the former VFW site, um, although that may not be enough to really, um, you know, get um, more than concept design, uh, demolition and concept design. And so the CPA funding would really be, you know, hopefully we could direct it there, um, whatever is needed. You know, whether that's more site preparation, getting it ready for a developer to hire someone to do concept studies in terms of how it would be programmed. Uh, you know, what's, what is the model there in terms of shelter, transitional housing services? And so some of that might be, you know, hiring um, a firm or a team that really looks at sites like that and, you know, knows the model and provides services um, to, to develop that. Uh, Strong Street, as I mentioned, is something where we've had wetlands delineated, natural heritage, um, rare species assessed, uh, but there's still some utility and engineering work that needs to be done to determine really what happens on that site. And so to me, that's another one to, um, to look at. Uh, the South Amherst campus is just something that's, you know, really in the early phases, but again, that could be, you know, an appraisal, a survey, uh, assessments of the building, are they feasible to be reused? And so, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, four to five contracts in the first year and four to five in the second year, um, some might be small contracts. So, you know, if we're doing a, an appraisal or a building assessment, that might be shorter in duration where if we're doing, you know, there might be overlapping contracts. And so at the same time, we could be doing something else on that site if we're, you know, doing, say, for instance, wetlands or, or another type of, um, you know, report or study. Uh, thank you, Knight. I have a follow-up question as well. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm sure you're, you and the planning staff are extremely busy with everything that's going on in the town um, through the last X number of years. I'm curious, though, uh, I saw the reference to the South Amherst School, a location that's near and dear to me, of course, uh, and to a number of folks in South Amherst. I'm wondering how... Um, or what process the town might have gone through to select the varying locations for potential housing develop and have they also has the town also considered other types of developments for these locations such as a community center at a place such as a school in South Amherst I realize it's housing we're discussing but I'm wondering about the general process of um identifying options and yeah uh, yeah so the town has a, a disposition policy you know uh, a surplus property policy and so although we'd be looking at housing it hasn't been uh, doesn't preclude any other assessments and so it could be that you know um the town would have to spend some money to assess the building and do you know kind of just a basic level assessment that would inform whether it could be reused for housing or another purpose the um and you know there is a process by which it would be chosen for housing, and so it could be that other uses are also looked at. And it doesn't um, it doesn't mean that we wouldn't assess it though, you know, for housing at the time. Uh, the other ones, you know, uh, 457 Main Street and Strong Street are really for those purposes, and that's what it's been outlined for. You know, the, the South Amherst campus agreed. Uh, it really hasn't been you know selected as a housing site. It's just something that, given its location, it's its size and that it's not being used for what, you know, it's not really being used right now. That was just, a, you know, something that's been looked at. Is there potential overlap that a study could be viable for alternative uses at a site such as that? It, yeah. So for instance, if we're looking at a site and we're doing, um, a, you know, a wetlands determination, uh, any hazardous materials or environmental assessments that could aid in housing or can aid in other, other uses. Um, you know, it's something that has to be done. Uh, affordable housing, typically when they get state or federal subsidies, they have to do a really thorough property assessment, uh, both everything from, you know, noise, pollution, uh, soils, water, air. And so uh, typically we can start that with pre-development funds. A developer then has to almost do, I wouldn't say do it all over again, but they have to do a really thorough job. And so typically CPA funds can, like I said, they can start the process and then they can be leveraged to seek other funds. So, you know, the CPA funds that could be used here, you know, there it's a, you know, it'd be a public report that others could use too. Uh, thank you, Nate. Uh, we're getting close to time frame. I appreciate the uh, 
presenters waiting in the audience will get to you shortly. Uh, Doug, I saw your hand up for a little bit here. Yeah, just a quick question. Uh, I realized I don't know exactly what property on Strong Street you're referring to. Sure. So if you're heading east on Strong Street, you go over the railroad tracks and you're going um, up the hill. And on your right, it looks like there's a private drive. There's four homes off of it. And in, in, the, in the back there, uh, it's 13 acres. It abuts the railroad tracks okay. on the west and on the east. It uh, It's on the top of the knoll and, um, um, you know, it's it's bounded by other property. So. OK, thank you. It, yeah, it's wooded right now. You know, if you you wouldn't know what it was if you drove by. It looks like it's a private drive, um, but it. Yeah. Uh, Dave. Yeah, just a quick follow up, Sam, to your question uh, to Nate about uh, properties like the South Amherst campus or or Strong Street. Um, part of what we do in planning and 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 working under Paul Bachman's guidance and direction is, yeah, uh, he would like us to look at a number of different alternative uses. So, two examples: when we look at um, the South Amherst, the former school on the South Amherst campus, or or even Hickory Ridge property. We'll be looking at multiple options there. As Nate said, staff will not determine those options. We may make recommendations to the town manager. He will then, uh, in the coming months or next few years, make recommendations to the town council as to how we proceed. Because housing is a stated high priority for the town, um, I will say that in most of my discussions and meetings, um, when we look at those sites, we we lead with housing. Um, you mentioned a community center. Um, I I will say that the direction we've gotten from the town manager is, um, and we know from the town council and and votes of our residents that it is very clear that you know we're building a new school. We're likely to move forward on a library, and the next two projects in line are a DPW and a fire station. Uh, maybe not in that order. Maybe in the reverse order. So um, we, we look at all of these properties and have looked at all of them um, with those, with those uh, facility needs in mind. Hickory Ridge uh, certainly could support a, uh, a fire station. It is not the available frontage and buildable land could not support a DPW. So we, we are not looking at that. But so definitely because of the high priority for housing, as Nate mentioned, even senior affordable housing, we often lead with that. Um, but again, it doesn't preclude us looking at a property for multiple uses. I will just say realistically, um, I certainly can't see us adding to that capital list of large projects in the next five to 10 years. Um, but I'm just one voice and one staff member. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Dave. Uh, thank you, Nate, for uh, taking the time and waiting. I know there's another session coming up and you're pulled in many directions. Uh, in the evening, in addition to the day. Um, before you depart, is there anything else you'd like to say? No, um, with the next presentation, um, you know, for the East Amherst um, study, I, I can, if Nancy's here to present on behalf of Steve Bloom and the committee, I could also help. Uh, so I'll just remain available. Wonderful. Uh, thank, thank you, Nate. And I'd like to go ahead and invite the next presenter uh, uh, into the audience, uh, Nancy Retner. And this is for the East Amherst Local Historic District Study Committee. Um, Nancy, I can see you and hopefully you can hear us. Uh, thank you for waiting patiently and thank you for your thorough application. Um, I'd like to open up the floor to you. We will not curtail your presentation based on our delayed starting time. Okay, uh, thank you for having us. Uh, Nate is here as well, and he can add, I think, to what I have to say. Uh, mostly, I think you've already seen uh, the application that Steve put in, but what we're talking about is the center of East Amherst, which was which is probably historically the most important part of town. It is the original part of Amherst. Uh, it was called East Hadley originally. The houses that we're talking about are nearly all pre-Civil War. Uh, it's his historically of enormous importance. And so we would like to turn this into a local historic district just to protect that area and keep it uh, 
maintain the character that it has now. I think Steve has probably answered most of your questions, but I'd be happy to respond to any questions you have about it. And Nate may want to uh, supplement what I've said. Now, I'll just jump in quickly to say that, you know, the the state, the Massachusetts Historical Commission outlines a pretty rigorous process to designate an area as a local historic district. And so uh, it involves inventorying and researching every property and properties that are outside the boundary. So they really want to know how did you determine the boundary? What's the significance of the properties? And then as a district uh, as a whole, and then, um, you know, you have to do a survey to residents. Um, you need to, we already have a bylaw in place so that makes it a little easier, but you have to uh, submit a preliminary study report, refine it, uh, do some more outreach and work in the community, and then submit a final report to the Massachusetts Historical Commission. So, you know, they often say it takes a year to do this. And maybe that it takes, you know, six to eight months if you, um, you know, more members of the commi commission volunteer, but it is, it is a process. It's not as if it's something that could happen in a week or two. It really does involve research and outreach and uh, you know, the, the property owners within the potential district. I can just add that when we did the Lincoln Sunset Historic District, we had three uh, trained historians to help us. And unfortunately, we don't, we're not in that position anymore. So uh, the process of having to go into Northampton to the city hall and research a lot of these properties, it's going to be a fairly time consuming process, we imagine. We, just to give you some sense of what we're talking about, though, we're talking about the original post office for Amherst, which was in part of a building in this area, uh, a tavern where uh, important historical decisions were made with regard to the Shays Rebellion. Uh, it's just historically a really interesting area. Um, okay, um, I guess I'll open it up for questions and comments from committee members, I see two hands up at present, three now. Um, I don't, I didn't see who raised their hand first, so I'll go left to right, uh, Tim. Uh, yes, I apologize if this was in the application, I frankly don't remember. Uh, for the other historic districts in town, did they ever receive CPA funding to help study uh, the viability and the necessary needs for their districts? Yes, yeah, so the Sunset uh, Lincoln group received uh, a grant of $5,000, but as I said, we had three trained historians who were working for free on that project, so we didn't need the same uh, amount of help. Uh, Bob? <clears throat> um, yeah, th this might be outside the boundaries of the meeting, but um, for the uh, property owners who are I, I can't remember the term. Is it incursion? They they they're non significant buildings. What are what are the implications if the um, historical district is put in place? Are there anything that they're overly concerned about since they're not historical buildings? So anyone who wants to make changes to the exter exterior part of the building would need to come before the local historic district to do so. It's only what you can see from the street. Uh, and we've already made uh, decisions that uh, to keep some things out of that. So uh, you can change the roof without having to come to the local historic district. You can put in, um, I think you can put in a, a mini split as long as you do things in a particular way, they can add something about that. So we, we've made a few uh, changes that make it easier for homeowners. And I think we're a pretty reasonable committee, but we try to keep the changes that are made be in the same basic style as they were before they, they come to us. So, so if you're a vinyl sided raised ranch to a unit, uh, building, you you can still be a vital sided <laughs> raised ranch to a unit building. Absolutely, there's not there's nothing going to happen to that that building. Okay. Yeah, okay. I was just going to say that the a local historic district you 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 document every property you know with photographs and an architectural description, and it doesn't mean that we're trying to return buildings to a period of significance. So it's not like oh well, if these are all eighteen twenty buildings, we want them to look like they're eighteen twenty buildings although they could. 
So right, uh, a mid-century building, although non-contributing to the district, uh, you know, could make you know still maintain its you know mid mid mid-century look. The importance, though, of having it in the district is that Mass Historic likes a you know a congruous district without taking out these properties because it could impact the rest of the district, for instance. So if say they want to demolish the house and build something else, then the district is in place to say, okay, what is the massing scale or architectural style? And so, you know, you wouldn't exclude any of those, even though they might not be, you know, they're more contemporary than the rest of the district. And so, uh, but we're not asking homeowners or requiring them to make them look historic. They can be maintained as they are at the adoption of the district. Thanks. Robin? Uh, hold on a second. Um, I just wanted to say that, um, first of all, that um, as the chair of the Historical Commission, I wanted to underscore um, the importance of research like this fulfilling um, one of the main charges of local uh, of historical commissions, um, which is to um, continue to build and update the historic inventory through um, the inventory forms, form beads that go into the macro system. So um, an added advantage of creating the local historic district is that part of the, um, the community's historic inventory will be um, updated and or increased. Um, I had a question there. Was, I think there was a proposal from a consultant in there. Is that the consultant that you've chosen or is there an RFP process? Uh, we have had discussions with that person and we would like to work with him. He seems to be very knowledgeable and reasonably priced. Just so, quickly though, okay. given the estimate, we'd have to seek three, three quotes. Uh, but, um, you know, we have to solicit something and then um, it may be that, you know, only one, one uh, consultant or one, there's one response, but, you know, we use that, that individual to get an estimate for what the work would cost. So we'd, you know, we'd be prepared okay. in our request to the CPA committee. Okay. Okay. Uh, Michelle. Um, yeah, thanks. I just want to confirm this is, is this only in regards to the buildings present within the historical district? And I guess specifically I'm asking about um, the common in the center of it and what protections or restrictions are afforded to it. And more specifically, because I'm interested in, and I forget the name of the committee, but there is interested in making that intersection and pathways and bikeways more safe for the new school and trying to encourage um, you know, non-vehicular uh, transportation through that intersection. So buses, scooting, biking, walking. And I'm just wondering if at all, if this would have any impact on that. And, you know, I understand probably not the facades of buildings, but what about the common? And if anybody needed to add a bike lane so kids could go safely to the new school, does this have any implications for that? I, I don't believe so. We really are only concerned with buildings. Uh -huh. And Personally, I would welcome exactly what you've described. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't. See, you know, if you wanted to put a building on the common, we would have a concern about that. Uh, but not. Yeah, the, to, the town common is protected by state law uh, in terms of what what buildings can be, um, you know, constructed on it. Anyways, uh, uh, there's um, two two uh, legal provisions there, but a local historic district is really structures or the built environment on private property. And so the common as part of the right of way, you know, um, typically isn't under jurisdiction of the local historic district. So, and, and anything on the ground plane is usually exempt from review. So, you know, any like road widening, walkways, anything substantially at grade is not uh, under review by the commission. So bike lanes or, you know, um, you know, any kind of pedestrian or circulatory network is not usually under review by the commission. Uh, yeah, I, I, I realize this is not really a hearing on creating a local historic district. Um, I, I am in support of, of the documentation and the research on these on these buildings. Uh, but I guess I did want to ask some at some point, and this is might as well be now, 
Um, our local historic districts once established uh, perpetual or does the town leadership have the option to uh, uh, you know decertify or whatever the word would be to alter their boundaries at some point in the future if it just decided that something needed to change thank you I'll defer to Nate on that one yeah, so it is a local, um, you know, a local decision. It, you know, it would have to be, um, you know, you'd have to work with the Massachusetts Historical Commission, but there are ways to amend boundaries, to shrink them, to move them to enlarge districts. So there is a process by which districts can change. I think, Doug, you're asking if it could be removed altogether. And um, I, I think that could be possible. I think there might be some you know, some discussion with the Massachusetts Historical Commission and, and local boards and committees and residents why that would, you know, why someone would want that. But I think it is a local decision to, you know, to change those boundaries. Uh, I have a question for Nancy or Nate. Um, <clears throat> thank you for the application with all the thorough documentation. Uh, if I understand correctly, you're doing research on properties to prepare for applications. And I understand that there's a local historic district. There's also, there are, there also are national historic districts, uh, as well as inventories in the state. Um, I didn't read the entire application uh, this afternoon, but could you, is the intent to commence with a local historic district to then be in a position to uh, present it further beyond that? Um, or is this uh, really to gather, do the research, uh, to have the resources available to the uh, town, historic commission and elsewhere uh, and stop with a local? Have, have you thought beyond uh, the immediate volume of work in front of you? <laughs> Well, to the best of my knowledge, our local historic district has not thought about this in terms of anything beyond just being a local historic district. The idea of this district did come to us from the town manager uh, who pointed us to this particularly interesting district uh, and whether he has other plans for it, I couldn't say, but uh, and maybe perhaps Nate can. I am not aware of any plans to do anything other than making this into a local historic district, which is a fairly big undertaking in itself. Yeah, I was going to say that it's already a national historic register district, and so the properties were inventoried, in a you know a district form was submitted, and it's you know uh, approved by uh, by the Massachusetts Historical Commission. It's now at the at the federal level, uh, that was done a while ago. Um, but that's that's an honorary designation, and so uh, you know local historic district is more regulatory in its review. I think, as Robin mentioned, it's really important to actually have the research and the documentation on these structures. So. What was done previously sometimes was, you know, a one-line description of the architecture, or it was a very, a very simple description of the, um, you know, the social or cultural significance of the property. And Massachusetts Historical Commission now really requires a, a much more thorough dive into the deed research, into, you know, the properties in the area, and they want, you know, a more extensive bibliography. And so, well, the, the through the process, we'll have, you know, 40, 30, 50, whatever inventory forms that are really well done with research, with uh, documentation of the property. Um, you know, once it's once those inventory forms are sent to Mass Historic, it's uploaded on the publicly available MACRIS. Um, it's a database, it's, uh, they'll be approved and they'll be on there. Um, and then, you know, I, I'm not really sure that it would be used for anything else right now, but, you know, just having that information is, is really important and can lead to the creation of the district. And it's, if I heard you correctly, it's the identical boundaries of the district that is currently the honorary designated one from the national? Yeah, that's the starting point. And so the Massachusetts Historical Commission, you know, will ask, well, why that? And we can say there's already been a justifiable boundary, but ideally you'd look at properties along the periphery and decide, you know, what, you know, does it move a property or two here or there? And so that's, that's part of the process is really defining those boundaries. Uh, but we're starting with the the National Register District. Thank you. Um, are there questions from other questions from 
or comments from committee members or staff? Um, Nancy, is there anything or Nate you'd like to add to? Uh, no, just to thank you for considering this application and thinking about uh, just how beneficial it would be to be able to get all this research done. Uh, thank you, Nancy. I know you were filling in for Steve, who is uh, traveling uh, at, at the moment uh, across continent, or actually across the Atlantic. Um, thank you so much for taking the time and for uh, presenting a, and submitting a thorough application and for your help. And we may or may not uh, have further questions that we would email to you. Um, and I guess we're good to go to the next presentation. Thank you again, Nancy. And Nate, I believe you're the applicant uh, designated contact on the next presentation. I guess you're the uh, the person of uh, sure. many, many, many yeah. months this evening. Yeah, so for everyone again, Nate Maloya, planner just, of the town. Let me I just work with the one second. Let me just communicate to those who are listening that the next application is for uh, town of Amherst and it is the uh, restoration of the north and south cemeteries. Uh, thank you, Nate. Go ahead. Oh, sure. Yeah, I was going to say that. So, yeah, the town we've um, uh, the town through in gosh, it's been about 10 years has really focused on West Cemetery in downtown. Uh, we've had a number of headstone uh, projects. Uh, the town tomb has been restored, um, but the North and South cemeteries have not uh, had that same kind of treatment. And so a few years ago, we did have the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission assess those cemeteries, document the stones with photographs, and, and determine that there is a lot of need there. There, you know, there are both historic cemeteries, um, you know, 200 years old, uh, and that, you know, the, st the stones are really, um, you know, there's a number of stones, at least 100 stones in each cemetery that need uh, restoration and repair. And so uh, this proposal seeks to, to restore and preserve 125 stones in each cemetery. So 125 in North Cemetery, 125 in South Cemetery. Uh, there's also monuments and other larger uh, um, structures that, that could be repaired. They, they cost more. Uh, so we've had work in West Cemetery recently where the average cost per stone is, we could say it's $400. Um, it does, you know, that's an average. So if a stone is in, intact and it just needs to be reset, it can be reset manually. If it's broken, it will need to be fixed. Uh, sometimes they need to have new footings. And then larger monuments may need uh, equipment and other things to restore them and stand them upright. And so that to fix a larger monument can be a few thousand dollars. That actually becomes a much, it's a, you know, a, a much higher um, price tag. The, um, and it also involves cleaning and, you know, taking off any growth. And so often not only does, you know, physical damage to the stone occur if they're broken or they fall, but also, you know, different growths and things on the stones will deteriorate the stones and actually cause them, you know, the, the lettering to become illegible. And so part of the work is actually cleaning the stones. It's a, a series of treatments using special uh, solutions. And so it's applied over a number of times and it will clean and whiten stones, uh, you know, what, Typically the stones are made out of soft material, softer material. Um, and so they do erode over time. Uh, additionally, we're looking at removing the fencing. And so as was noted in the application, South Cemetery used to just be delineated by hitching posts, granite hitching posts. Uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure North Cemetery had something similar. It wasn't, um, it wasn't documented in some of the research. Uh, there was some reference to, they started off at the same time and they had some of the same treatments in terms of landscaping. And so really, from the town's perspective, it would, it would be beneficial to not have a chain link fence around North Cemetery, or there's remnants of a barbed wire fence around South Cemetery, and go back to what was you know, historically there, granite markers. Um, and it, it would reflect the aesthetic of the, of the cemeteries. And honestly, it's easier in the long run in terms of maintenance and, and costs. And so you know, the proposals for headstone restoration and for fence removal and then marker installation. Uh, thank you, Nate. I'd like to, uh, assuming you're 
okay with it, I'd like to open it up to questions or comments from committee members. I see a hand up, uh, Robin. Um, Nate, I'm a little um, embarrassed to admit that I don't know if these cemeteries have been documented in macros. Yeah, they, they, are, they are. They're older. So the, you know, similar to like East Amherst, they were documented years ago. The forms are somewhat incomplete. The Pioneer Valley Planning Commission looked at them in the 2000 teens uh, with photographic uh, documentation, but there's no, you know, um, historical research. There's some historical research done uh, just on the cemetery in general. Okay, but, but they look like those older forms that are like a few lines and typewritten lines and not much they, else. They added to it. They've actually added to it. Uh, Bonnie oh, okay. Parsons, who had worked at PVPC as their preservation planner, did do a little more research. So there is a, a bit more narrative that was added, I think, in 2014. Okay. Yep. Uh, Michelle? I think I was last with the hand up, but oh, I, I'm afraid I didn't see them. It's uh, okay. I'm um, since I'm already unmuted. I guess I'm just curious about. Um, I mean, four to five hundred dollars a stone with public money that just for me seems like a strange use of um, funds. Like I, you know, it's a single family person, and I understand their aesthetic and I understand the history, but. Um, do you can you give like a a two second on like pitch on why that is good use of public funding to fix um, a gravestone and secondary to that like I did ask about the the trust or the it's a non-wasting endowment that goes into into buying that uh, grave site and there is funding available for that but it hasn't been used so I'm curious about the use of those funds and what the plan is going forward if there's no more space and is this going to be sort of a perpetual CPA ask if there is no more um, endowment money for maintaining the gravestones? Sure, I think the the you know the the headstones like I said are the you know some of them are two hundred over two hundred years old and so it's really it's beyond you know maintenance what town staff would do so really you hire a qualified contractor. To restore the stones, and I think I think it is really important. So cemeteries, you know, played a role in terms of open space, in terms of um, you know recognizing the community. And so, in the inventory forms, they noted that you know both were pastures. So uh, you know traditionally they were grazing grounds, even when they were cemeteries, and they served you know communal aspects. And so understanding that part of the history where they're located in the village centers, all of that makes you know cemeteries as integral to uh, you know a community as a town common. And so. You know, in other instances, if it's a private cemetery, it may not. Um, but, you know, in Amherst, we have Wildwood Cemetery, which is actually an Olmstead design, and it's very park-like. And so that is a unique cemetery. If it was something that was different, it was a private cemetery, um, and it was more modern, it may not have the same kind of, you know, historical significance as these cemeteries in Amherst. And so I think there is value to keeping the cemetery available for public education, for learning. Um, and so it's, it, you know, the stones themselves are, you know, have to be taken with care. And so it's not as if you could just go in there and get some epoxy from Home Depot, fill the crack, you know, put it together and stand it up. You have to use, like I said, special materials designed for those types of stones. And it takes a qualified consultant to, you know, someone to do that. You know, I will say when we did the recent work at West Cemetery, there are fewer and fewer people who are qualified to do this work. And so, um, the people we are using at a Lolo Memorial, they're bidding on projects in, you know, Nantucket and Vermont, and New Hampshire. There used to be a firm out of the Berkshires and their, um, the, one of their kind of principals has retired. And so it's actually harder to find someone who is qualified and has the skills to work on, you know, different stones that are, you know, 200 years old. And so, um, but I do think it is worthwhile. And so the, to me, the price actually is not, not that bad. Um, considering it's all manual and it's, you know, all skill-based. There is a second part of the question, which is the, the funding that's available that hasn't been. Oh, sure, the, the funding. Yeah. So um, the cemeteries are maintained by the division of trees and grounds through public works. And so the funding there, I think is really uh, to be used for um, what wouldn't be considered, um, you know, this historic preservation work. And so I'm actually not, 
I can't speak to it that well in terms of your question, you know, what could that be funding be used for? And, you know, why hasn't it, or what could they do in the future with it? And so I think, you know, it is something to ask, you know, how do we, how do they manage that? Because you don't want to deplete the funding there. Uh, it needs to be a perpetual fund for the maintenance and, you know, routine maintenance and uh, everything with the cemeteries. And so, um, you know, they've been trying to maintain that balance. So they are using that $113 balance in some way, but just not for gravestone restoration. That's my, that would be my understanding. And I, I, you know, I can't say for sure. I'd have to ask Alan Snow or Amy um, how they've been using that, but it wouldn't be for restoration. Thanks. Uh, Bob? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not really up to speed on cemetery law, I guess, but um, I'm just curious when, when, the town either, did, does the town accept payment for these cemetery plots? Yes, so you have to purchase a private plot. Okay, and and so do they then assume an obligation to maintain it within a certain, um, you know, uh, I guess criteria for the, for the gravestones as well as the actual piece of land? Is there an obligation uh, that goes along with that? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, in West Cemetery, there's a newer section with headstones that are, you know, um, you know, from the 20th century and, and, and more recent. And so those families, if those are active plots, you know, the the families are really, um, you know, the town would ask, would reach out to those um, those plot owners first. Some of these plots are so old, they they're considered abandoned. And so, you know, trying to locate the next of kin from someone uh, from, you know, 18, the 1850s, you know, that's, it's long been abandoned and it's assumed by the town to be maintained. So it's not, you know, I, there is, you know, there is a, I, I don't know if there's a, you know, some statute of limitations, right? I don't know if it's 20 years or 10 or 40, but at some point uh, the town would go through a process of trying to notify the owners and, you know, through that process, it then becomes abandoned and it becomes mm -hmm. the um, responsibility of the town. But there is a, a, a legal process for that. Tim? Yes. Um, if we have limited funds, uh, do you have a priority whether you'd spend which money to be spent on the headstones or the fencing? Oh, I would say the headstones. You know, like I mentioned, that that's a, you know, more of a skilled craft and it's something that, you know, you don't really want volunteers doing. And so um, it actually, <laughs> um, as I, a number of years ago, we actually had volunteers from UMass who said they would come in and clean stones in West Cemetery. Um, it was, I think this was like 10 or 12 years ago. And fortunately, there was a conservator there the day they were trying to do it. And he said, absolutely not. You know, you they the way they were going to go about it, say with wire brushes, trying to scrub off lichen on marble would just ruin the stone. And so it's really not something you would have volunteers do. So even um, a few years ago, I had offered to try to, you know, leverage the services of the consultant asking, could you train like me, you know, or a volunteer or two? And they said, it's really not something you can do in an hour or two and train someone. And so, you know, really we're, you know, the funding is used to hire the expertise of someone who knows how to restore and preserve the stones. You, Robin? Um, so I just wanted to comment on the concept of, um, the graves themselves and particularly their inscriptions being worthy of, of preservation. Um, and they did a good job of talking about the land itself. And I was trying to think of an analogy that the words that we use in preservation are significance and integrity. And so the cemeteries have already been deemed signif historically significant, but um, integrity relates to how much of the loss of the historical historical fabric you have. So if you have a, a house that doesn't really read as, as the kind of structure that it was built before it's lost its integrity. So to lose, um, to lose the gravestones over time in that way diminishes the integrity of, of the graveyard as a whole. So I was trying to think like, if you had a Victorian house with a porch then you allowed the porch to deteriorate to the point that it had to be removed that building would lose a lot of its historical integrity because those items are related to each other and the 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 history of the, the 
the townspeople where they were buried is related to settlement patterns. And so it all kind of comes tied together um, when when gravestones pass into a point where they become historically significant and are not just something that belongs to a family. Uh, thank you, Robin. Michelle? Yeah, I just want to follow up. Um, I think that the sort of the public commons aspect of the graveyard, you know, resonates a lot. And same with the ones in town, which, you know, I grew up in Amherst and it was places that I, you know, found refuge. And I think a lot of people enjoy birding in the Wildwood Cemetery and that's all great. So having the fence removed seems like a good way to sort of open it up back to that Olmstead sort of public good, public common way. But I understand that might not be a great priority and just what is sort of the public access and involvement to the cemetery right now or does anybody go to it is it you know is there any PR to say hey we have this historical resource and then lastly just that there are new plots being sold in the west cemetery that could potentially in 20 or 50 years go into just abandonment and you know the towns uh need to maintain them that seems you know, kind of like a red flag, like this is a known cost that's going to be the burden to the town. Is there any, you know, conversation about, in, you know, changing the way that that's funded in the long term so that CPA in like, you know, 50 years isn't having this same conversation? And that's probably a bigger question, but it's hard for me not to ask it because it's on the table with these hundred year old ones. Yeah, I mean, I would say that, um, you know, it's, at least stones being installed today should be able to last for 100 years without a lot of maintenance. And so, um, you know, what we're looking at are stones that were hand carved. You know, they might not have been very deep etchings. You know, the, the, the actual marble or slate or different stones were were softer. And so the stones that are being installed today, you know, they're putting on they're put on bases. Um, so they're elevated above the ground. You know, they're not directly buried. And so often you know, older stones would be direct buried. They would just take the slab and put it in the ground and then the frost would break it at the ground. The lettering, um, you know, is not very deep. And so then it, it erodes with weather. The stones today are put on a base and then the actual monument itself is raised above the ground and it's protected from all that freezing and thawing. And so, you know, I think the, you know, I don't wanna call it technology, but the knowledge of how to have a stone stay, you know, be maintained or last longer is being employed now. Um, but I, you know, I do think that, you know, your point about what kind of the future maintenance program is, is important. I think that, you know, these older stones just, you know, they, you know, that wasn't a consideration, right. And, um, when they were installed. And so, you know, I think in those cemeteries, it's a lot of granite and West cemetery. I think there's like five types of stones, but they're all the type of stone that, you know, is susceptible to weather, to freezing and thawing to other things in West cemeteries or, um, in North and South cemetery, the, you know, I think it's two or three materials uh, for the stones, but the same thing they're you know, they do, um, they do kind of erode over time, right? They, they, you know, they don't maintain their, their lettering and legibility as well as stones being used today. Um, Nate, I have a question regarding the fencing removal in the mm -hmm. North Cemetery. Uh, your comment regarding the UMass volunteers and the potential for destruction of the West Cemetery uh, makes sense having walked through it. Although I wonder if that potential for destruction could be deployed effectively uh, in the demolition of, a, uh, of the fence in the North. And uh, I guess the question is, uh, do you know uh, how those types of fences are removed. That is to say, does someone come in with a backhoe and lift them up? Or are they dug by hand both? And or is that something that uh, might be able to be accomplished via alternate means from uh, external, uh, external um, contracting? Sure. Yeah, I think the um, I was gonna say that, you know, it wasn't any fault of the volunteers previously. It was just, you know, when, you know, um, I've seen but, them. They're, but, they're, they're fragile. Some of those. Yeah, they are. Yeah. Um, no, the fence, the fence work really, it, it's going to be done by machine. And so most of those, um, the posts are probably put in concrete footings that are just too heavy to do, man, you know, manually. So you would have a machine go in there. You could manually clear around the fence. 
and maybe take out the the chain link itself. Um, but the the removal of the the post and the structure of it would be done using equipment. And so it's not something that you know most you know most individuals couldn't do that. You need like a licensed um, operator to do that. And does the town have such equipment and such operators? It does. I think that, um, you know, it's beyond what would be, I think we mentioned in the application, typical maintenance. So this would become a, a project to, you know, deploy, you know, staff and equipment to do that. Yeah. Along with all the other myriad of things that are going on. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, other questions from members? I thought I saw a hand up from Doug. I'm not seeing you on my screen, Doug, if you're there with a question, please. Uh, speak. Yeah, well, you did for a brief moment. Um, uh, Michelle had brought up the fee structure that's used for new plots at West Cemetery. And I don't think we really heard an answer about that and whether there was any uh, reconsideration of the fees so that they actually last in perpetuity rather than uh, you know, needing other sources of funding. Yeah, I, you know, I, I can't answer that. I know, um, you know, from personal experience, when you buy in a private cemetery, there is, it's a pretty, um, you know, can be sometimes a significant fee, depending on the number of plots, and then there's an annual fee. I don't know how the town structures, structures that. And so, again, that's something Amy and Alan could speak to. Um, you know, you don't want to have it be become a you know financial obstacle or barrier for families. So I think you know the town probably considers it if it's you know a municipal cemetery, you know, what's kind of the reasonable pricing as opposed to a private cemetery. But I think that's something to ask. Um, are there any additional questions or comments from committee members? Uh, is there anything else you'd like to share with the committee at this time, Nate? No, no, thanks for um you know, we went a little bit over time. So thanks for hearing the presentations and the questions. Uh, thank you for presenting and answering the questions and for sticking around and juggling all the uh, varying projects you have uh, in front of us and elsewhere. Um, I guess we're good for now. There's a chance that we may have additional questions, in which case we would reach out via email. Uh, so thank you, Nate. Sure, thanks. Yep. <clears throat> so... Uh, the next item, would everyone like to take a couple minute break now or shall we continue? I'm seeing head shaking. No folks are fatigued. Uh, I'm content if no one needs a break now to continue. Um, Holly, the next item on the agenda, I believe, is financial update. I know that you had provided a uh, spreadsheet or a document. Um, are you there? Um, we can't hear you if you were there. Not sure where, hang on everyone. Why don't we take a two minute break? Let's take a two minute break and I'll see uh, if I can get a hold of Polly. We'll start at uh, 739. I'm here. I just um. What? Hello. Oh, okay. Can folks hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Oh, everybody's gone. Everybody went take took a break. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I just I could not unmute for some reason. I am, but uh... <laughs> yeah, we had a we had a two minute break.
So, uh, Holly, can you hear us or me? Hmm. Uh, yes, yeah, she. I I confirmed that she could hear us and that she could be heard, but then everybody went on a break. <laughs> Thank you for confirming. I stayed, I stayed here, holding it all together. <laughs> Thank you. We'll await Holly's uh, return. Sorry. Oops. So, uh, um, so I can, I will try to pull it up. Unfortunately, it's. I saw it earlier. Yeah, I have to like log into my computer at work. And so it comes out very tiny on the laptop. So I'm not sure if people are going to be able to see that. There's a chance that I could download it on mine or I'm not sure. Yeah, if you have the if if you could queue it up and just see, um, but I, I don't know. If... That. I can see what you have on the screen. Okay. I don't know about other members. It's so right, but it might be able to be enlarged. This would... is this is the same as it was at the last meeting. We're still um, have not received um, our FY. 23 state match that we receive um in fy24 so again it's an these are estimated balances at this point um with um our beginning balance at uh july 1st of this year um estimated uh local money that we will take in through the cpa charge on the real estate tax bills the estimated um, state match, which would be our FY23 match that we would receive in FY24, adding another 275000 to that. And then we have to take out the um, the proposals that we've already voted in FY24 or for FY24. And we do currently also have some money that is set aside in a budgeted reserve. So that would be our estimated ending balance of the 686 165. I can't even read it myself. <laughs> um, Are you able to place your cursor or your mouse on the section that you're referring to? Oh, that's good. Can I get this to go? Um, so that's he, easier. So that's the um, this is our would be our estimated year-end balance for FY24. And since these are our FY25 proposals that we're speaking of now, we take that beginning balance and we add in our estimated local tax for um, FY25, our estimated state match for FY25, and it gives us our available appropriation. Um, we do have debt service on several projects from years past that we are obligated to pay. That's estimated right now at 520,000. So we'll need to take that out. So that would give us a balance of one, about $1.5 million, again, estimated for new projects that can be um, approved for FY25. Um, just bearing in mind over here, the state requires a 10% minimum to each of the three categories based on what your estimated revenues are. So 10%, we need to make sure that we allocate at least 137,000 um, to each of the categories. Um, and then below there is what the estimated um, debt payments are for the projects that are already um, committed to just so that folks have that. And so right now, 
we have available or we're estimating we'll have available approximately 1.5 million. We can decide to use the budgeted reserve we have. That would give us 1.7. If we don't use that budgeted reserve and, and keep that as a reserve for any other projects that come um, you know, through the pipeline, um, that has to be used by June 30th, 2024. It cannot roll over into FY25 unless we decide to not use it. We'd have the one, if that makes sense. We have the 1.5 million. So the projects that are proposed right now um, as they stand are about 2.4 million. So we have a shortfall of 900,000 approximately. Um, these numbers will hopefully soon we will receive our state match and that number will likely change historically it has been higher than that but we usually you know are pretty conservative in what our estimate is going to be so there will likely be a little bit more money available um we also can look at um some of the old projects and we'll be looking to get some updates on those. And if there's anything that is not going to be moving forward that can be rescinded and could go back into the available budgets as well. But as of right now, we're estimating a $1.5 million availability for new projects. Uh, thank you, Holly. And in addition, there's the 164,000 uh, that you referenced earlier that is currently um, budgeted reserved for fiscal year 24. And if we chose to um, place that into fiscal year 25 by vote, that would become available. That's um, right. So I have a question for you. I see the state match in 23 and the state match in 24 are both 275. Uh, they both say estimate. You are indicating that both of them are going to be somewhat different than what we're assuming there, right? It's not they just the 24 one that's an estimate. It's both years. Well, both years are estimates, but the 24 one we'll know about very soon. We can't, we can't really um, estimate out another year from now on what we will get as more and more communities have joined. Um, the CPA, some of that state match has been reduced. Um, we use 25% as a fairly conservative number. Um, this one will be known for FY24. This one will be known very soon. This one won't be known for an entire year. So we wouldn't we wouldn't change that estimate. But this will become will should be soon. <laughs> um, coming to the town and then we'll know exactly what that number is and we will adjust this. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, does do any committee members have questions regarding what Holly has uh, displayed or is uh, discussing? Not seeing any. I see a hand from Robin. Um, yeah, I, I guess maybe we don't usually. Um, I was just curious about the bonding budget, um, but that, I guess that's something that we can discuss later. We don't need to discuss it now. That's sort of like what the projects we're paying for in debt service um, to get a sense of what, you know, what might be comfortable doing a bond as opposed to a, a straightforward grant. So I, I mean, I guess I'm not sure what that question is. The bonding oh, I mean, is. It's basically like the, it's, I mean, it's a spreadsheet for another meeting. It's just the one where it's like, oh, this, these, you know, so that you kind of see what peters out over time, like, you know, how many payments are left in which projects. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's summarized right here at the bottom. So these are the projects. And again, um, these are the projects that are currently bonded. The mm -hmm. Fort River School Fields has not started yet. So that okay. will yeah. be yeah. added. So th this here is year three of 10, year 10 of 10. Right. Five of right. so these ones right. will be going away in FY25. Okay. Yep. Are, okay. Are so you, Robin, are you referring to the implications in future? 
fiscal year. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is FY FY twenty five. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's I can share that one that goes out beyond and into yeah. the other years when we get um when we get to our decision yeah. making. Yeah. Yeah. But this thank is you. Just thank you for pointing 25, that out. Twenty five. I'm sorry. I wouldn't have seen the one in ten, three and ten. I, I missed that part. <laughs> uh, Michelle. I was just curious if you had a sense of if there are and how many projects that would be going forward that would reallocate funds into this year's budget or the FY25. When you I, would, yeah. Yeah, I don't know right off the top of my head. I know we had done a lot of cleanup on there were some some old um, projects that had not moved forward. We've done a lot of cleanup of those. So there's not really a lot out there. Um, I can prepare, uh, you know, what the available balances are in other projects at this time. And we can review and see if we want to look to, you know, ask folks, you know, what their status is and will they be, um, will they be using or are they ready to release? I don't think that there's much out there right now. Uh, Dave. Yeah, I was just going to say that I can I can work with Holly on that uh, to look at available balance, but I, I kind of agree with her. I don't think there's a lot out there that's not going to move forward, but we can certainly take a look at that. You know, um, there are some projects that, you know, may have stalled a little bit and see if we can jumpstart those as well. Yeah. Yes. Um, so in summary, for me, uh, walking away, assuming all these numbers, the requests for this year, fiscal 25, exceed the available funds by about 900,000. So we have a challenge. That is correct. correct. Okay. Uh, unless we take one of the sort of back to uh, Holly's question, not Holly, uh, Michelle's question, potentially one of the larger projects we might elect to bond it, which then lowers the uh, capital price tag, but increases the bonding. So we have to think about that. But for our, our thinking, we have a challenge of about $900,000 uh, over at the moment. Okay, thanks. I have a question which Holly, you may or may not be able to respond to at this point in time, but uh, following up on Tim's bonding comment, are there certain projects uh, that or funding requests that would not be eligible for bonding based upon the nature of the project request? I'm thinking, for example, uh, funding for a trust or something along those lines. Um, that is a good question. Okay. I I don't necessarily think. I just think that the um. Ooh. We don't need that answer now. It's just something that popped into my head, uh, triggered by Tim's inquiry. Yeah, so that that is a great question because if it's not, I'm trying to think of how to how to word this. Um, you you have to it has to have a useful life that is at least as long as the bonding period so you know you can't you know same thing with your own finances you can't buy a vehicle that's expected to last you for 5 years and bond it or pay for it over 20 years um so it it would have to have a useful life that's at least as long as the um you know a 5 to 10 year bonding period so development funds, something like that. I'm not so sure if we would be able to borrow for those because they don't have a necessarily useful life. Um, but I will I will look into that. Although uh, revitalization of a war memorial area, would that more likely be one that would uh, uh, be similar 
uh, to what occurred with Crocker Farm Fields last year, if it was something the committee uh, had an interest in. Um, are there questions from other uh, other questions from committee members or anyone? We uh, we seem to have accomplished everything on our agenda, <laughs> and uh, uh, we ran a little bit over with projects. But Holly, I, I want to thank you for uh, putting together the uh, financial proposal on top of all the other uh, things you have going on. Um, I think it's uh, quite helpful, uh, certainly to me, uh, to just get the general indication, and I assume to other committee members. We are meeting again next Thursday, uh, and then the 30th, uh, the following two weeks thereafter, we're not meeting the week of Thanksgiving. Uh, so there'll be an email uh, to members with the agenda and details. Um, <clears throat> Are there any final comments that anyone would like to make before we adjourn? Well, thank you all for uh, being here this evening and uh, I'll see everyone next Thursday. I will adjourn the meeting at 7.55 PM. Thank you all. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Bye.